preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Good evening. My name is Laura Kaminsky. As Associate Education Director for the Humanities at the 92nd Street Y, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this second evening of Critics on Criticism, film. One announcement. The fourth evening of this series features two speakers, Jack Kroll and Richard Grenier. It was originally scheduled for Monday, December 17th, but has had to be rescheduled to Tuesday, January 15th. Please make a note of this date change. I hope it does not pose any conflicts for you. If it does, please call the box office to arrange for a refund for your tickets. Regarding the format this evening, following the moderated conversation on stage, you will be able to submit written questions on the index cards which you received as you entered the hall. Please write your questions clearly on the cards and pass them to the aisles. In about 45 minutes, ushers will collect the cards and bring them backstage for presentation. We are delighted this evening to welcome back our series moderator, Dr. Annette Insdorf, who tonight will be talking with John Simon. John Simon is one of today's foremost film critics. He is also a drama critic and writes frequently on all the arts, including opera, ballet, and fine arts. Born in Yugoslavia, Mr. Simon was educated there, in Great Britain, and in the United States at Harvard from where he received his doctorate in comparative literature. He has taught at Harvard, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Bard College, and the Universities of Washington and Pittsburgh. He has received Fulbright and Rockefeller Fellowships, the Polk Award for Film Criticism, and a Literary Award from the American Academy of Arts and Letters. Currently, Mr. Simon is film critic for the National Review, drama critic for New York Magazine, and cultural columnist for The New Leader. Formerly, he served as critic for Esquire, Arts, The Hudson Review, Maclean's, and Vogue. Book reviews and articles on the arts have appeared in The New York Times, Saturday Review, Harper's, The Atlantic, Partisan Review, and many others. Mr. Simon's books include Acid Test, Private Screenings, Ingmar Bergman Directs, and Paradigms Lost, Reflections on Literacy and Its Decline. It is an honor to have him here this evening. Please join me in welcoming Annette Insdorf and John Simon. Thank you. Good evening to all of you. I'd like to start off by asking uh, how you became a film critic and were there any particular influences that you'd like to cite? Well, just lucky, I guess. Uh, how did it begin? Uh, I guess I did something for the, uh, for the new leader on drama and I did some book reviews and they wanted to hire me but they I was doing drama somewhere else, and they did want me doing something for them, and I said, I could do films for you. And they said, yeah, but we already have a film critic. So I said, but is he any good? And they said, well, not really. So I said, well, in that case, fire him, and I'll do it. <laughs> and they did. And he went on to do uh, good things in other areas. He wrote a book about Vietnam that I guess is a classic. And... <clears throat> Sorry, just... I said he went on to do good things in other areas. He wrote a classic book about the Vietnam War, and I became the a new leader's film critic. What made you think that you could or should be a film critic rather than the other things you were writing about? Well, because I think criticism is really not particularly localizable. I think all criticism is criticism, and just like food, I mean, I would hate to be an expert on um, Far Eastern food and never taste French or um, Italian or whatever. Um, so I would hate to write about one art and feel excluded from all the others because I think they're all interdisciplinary really. And so I do something with all the arts except architecture and 
once I've even done that. And had you grown up watching a lot of films, and was that a basis for your desire to do this? Yes, yes. I mean, oh, sure. I mean, growing up in Yugoslavia, one went to movies, just as one does in this country. I don't think one eats popcorn, but the films <laughs> taste the same. Um, when I read some of your work, I get the feeling that perhaps James Agee might have been someone that you read early on, because I guess both of you seem concerned about the ultimate standards of film, in other words, the critic as a kind of teacher raising standards. Um, was that somebody? Oh, I'm very fond of Agee, but, but I can't begin to hope to have his kind of humanity, which is extraordinary. Uh, he is a man who had more Christian spirit in his reviewing than any other reviewer I can think of without becoming a fool. Uh, and uh, that is a, is a remarkable synthesis that he accomplished there, and I can't claim to be that Catholic in my tastes, that, that kindly to uh, things that I don't really appreciate, and so on and so forth, but I, I do admire him very much. In fact, you've taken a real stand uh, in your work and in your interviews about the critics' need to have a moral position, and I was wondering if you could tell us something about your criteria, what you look for in a film. Well, it's hard to say what I look for, because if I knew what to look for in a film, that would, close me to, that would close me up to anything new and different that the filmmaker might produce. And if I were looking for anything more specific than excellence, which I do look for, um, I think I would be doing the filmmaker an injustice. Uh, certainly, since you mentioned morality, I do think that a film, like any other work of art, has to have human relevance. I do not like particularly abstract art in painting because I think it has no human relevance. I don't like certain type of music, such as minimalist music, because I don't think it says anything to me. And very elegantly, I assume that I'm, like Rousseau, I assume that I'm a human being and that therefore all other human beings are more or less like me. And if Steve Reich and, uh, and uh, Philip Glass don't speak to me, I assume that they don't speak to anyone except to phonies. And, uh, or fools, I mean, I don't know. Uh, but um, um, yes, I think some kind of human content is what I look for. Something that tells people something that they need to know. And by people, I mean, of course, not only myself, but I don't exclude myself either. And um, I look for something that I felt I wouldn't have known or quite so well known or quite so deeply felt or quite so uh, acutely reflected about unless that film had made me alert to it. In other words, I would like to be slightly changed by any film that I see, and certainly I feel slightly changed by any good film that I see. I wish the change were bigger, but I take that that's my fault and not the films uh, when the change is minimal. But at least some kind of change should exist. I should be alerted, I should be sensitized, I should be awakened, I should be... Um, made aware of something that I was either not aware of at all or insufficiently aware of before. There are other things too, but it'll come out as we talk. That's the beginning, I think. Do you approach the plays, for example, that you review in the same manner? Do you demand the same kinds of experiences from the theater work and the film work? Yes, I think all art, and that's, that's what makes all art so exciting, is that, that it all strives or should strive, as I perceive it, for the same thing, which is to make human beings more human, to make, for example, uh, the great emotions, whether they be love or, or, uh, or conquest of mortality or fear of, of let's say, uh, weakness or fear of old age or fear of dying, um, all the human problems that we have, I think all art somehow must address itself directly or indirectly to those and must somehow make us 
better at dealing with them, make us more ready to face them when face them we must. And if it doesn't do that, I don't care whether it's music, I don't care whether it's uh, ballet, I don't care whether it's um, painting, if it doesn't do that, I think it's shirking its responsibility. Now, these days you write, from what I can gather, almost equally about theater and film. Which do you consider to be more vital these days? Which do you seem to enjoy writing more about? Well, there's no denying that as I sit here in New York doing theater and film, there's much more happening in film than there is in theater, only because film has become truly international Whereas for a number of reasons, some good and some not so good, film, the theater is much more localized, much more parochial. It doesn't travel as easily. I mean, that we all know. It's not so simple to pack up a French or German or English or Swedish production of a play or, or, or anything else that's performing arts and bring it over to uh, New York or wherever. Whereas a film sits in a can and travels very um, comfortably and easily and inexpensively. So film in that sense has an unfair advantage in that when we talk film, we're talking about the films of the world, whereas when we talk theater, even granted that an occasional foreign play gets a New York production, but very seldom does the entire company of a successful European, let's say, or Asiatic uh, play come over as a block, and uh, that of course is a loss, that is a deprivation, because in many cases we are not so equipped to, um, to do that particular play. Whereas a film is a film, is a film, and it's there, and we sit in the same kind of theaters, in the same kind of seats, and see the exact same thing, with or without popcorn, always. Uh, do you actually sit in the same kinds of theaters, or do you tend to see the films in screening rooms with other critics? Oh, I see, see them both ways, and unlike some colleagues, I don't have any preferences. Mind you, if an audience is particularly stupid and particularly uh, objectionable and carries on um, loudly and disgustingly, uh, then I prefer a screening room. But one really revolting person in a screening room, uh, behind you or beside you or in front of you, can make things almost as dreadful <laughs> as a big theater full of um, louts. <laughs> Is there a difference for you between writing for, say, the National Review and New York Magazine? Are there greater limitations placed on you at either publication? Are you edited at one or the other? Uh, there is a nice paradox at work here. The more conservative a publication is, the more, how should I say, the more, e the more even reactionary a publication is, the more they seem to leave their critics alone. Because the more convinced they are that the critic is a totally marginal creature and <laughs> does not affect the presidential election, does not affect anything political or that matters. And therefore, in the National Review, I mean, I could say, uh, I could say, uh, screw Pin uh, Pinochet, and they wouldn't bat an eyelash. And indeed, I've said such things. Or I can say that um, Kissinger and Nixon are disgusting, and uh, that um, something like um, the Killing Ground makes this clear, and they don't bat an eyelash. Um, whereas at New York, which tries to sort of please a certain wider and more unpredictable and more um, volatile audience, uh, one gets slightly more uh, breathed down the neck. Uh, not much more, because I wouldn't last at a publication, and I wouldn't want to last at a publication where I would be heavily controlled and censored and told you can do this and you can't do that. But occasionally, occasionally they do they do uh, boggle, whereas at a place like the Hudson Review, where I was for 20 years, I don't think they ever changed anything I wrote, except maybe three times in 20 years. They said, wouldn't it be better to make two sentences out of that sentence, or something like that. Uh, and that's in 20 years. And uh, at the National Review, they've never said anything. Um, at the New Leader, I do have an editor who thinks he knows about 
the English language and and he was taught in high school that witch is a bad word and that that is a good word and so I'm not allowed to use many witches I have to uh, and once I think when I said that Barbara Streisand is the sort of thing that starts pogroms I think uh, that was censored and one or two other things like that um, but not many Whereas New York Magazine did not censor your likening Liza Minnelli to a beagle face, if I remember correctly. Well, it was more elaborate than that. I mean, <laughs> it loses in prose translation, but it's something like that, yeah. And in terms of the uh, limitation on the space, uh, is that a problem for you at either publication, at any of them? Is which a problem? Uh, limitation of space. Oh, space. Yes, it's always a problem. I think, I think the, the anomaly of this of this country is that that here we are the biggest and the richest and the most leisure cursed country of them all and yet we have only one column one film column that allows the critic enough space and that's the New Yorker although you mentioned commentary a moment ago when we were talking and I never see commentary, but I assume that that may be true. It, it's possible that commentary is generous too. All right, so let's say that there are two magazines in this entire country where the film critic gets enough space to, um, to develop his ideas. And it's damned unfair because uh, a great deal of admiration, I think, that Pauline Kael gets. Some of it is, is merited and, and, uh, and earned, but a lot of it is really the fact that she has more space and more freedom to um, develop her ideas in when, than, than anybody else has. And in terms of choosing which films you want to write about, is that totally your decision or are suggestions yes. made to you? Oh yes, I mean they, at the, at, the, at the National Review, they don't even know what's playing until they... <laughs> You know, uh, until I, you know, I, the other day I brought in my review of The Killing Fields and my editor there said, is Sam Waterston playing Sidney Shandberg? You don't say, ha, ha, ha. Until then she had no idea that such a thing had happened or was conceivable. Hmm. <laughs> Uh, and when you decide that you'll write about a film, do you generally see it only once, or does it occur to you to see it twice or more? Well, it depends on which magazine I'm writing for at the time and how difficult the film is. Also, in some cases, how loathsome the film is. If it's extremely loathsome and I want to do a very good job demolishing it, I do make the effort to see it more than once. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you've got to go once just to hate it, and then you go the second time to take notes and, uh, and so on. Uh, but if a film is very difficult, say a, a Bergman film, obviously one tries to see it twice, and maybe, ideally, even three times. But there are very few films that merit that kind of sacrifice. Uh, mm, uh, I, this, this does not mean that those films shouldn't be seen again and again in the course of years, but to see a film three times just for one little old review, that's asking a lot. Um, but some films ask it, and I think deserve to ask it. And um, ordinarily I see it once, but the trouble is this, you see, when you were right, say, for the National Review, and then again, if you were, when I was writing for Esquire, and when you were on a very, uh, how should I say, hard-edged deadline, and the magazine was locked into um, shape uh, at a very early time, and the review had to be in there by such and such time or else, then you actually, even though it's a monthly, you had less time to write your review in some cases, um, you must know about this, than when you write for a weekly. Um, but ordinarily it is just one seeing, but the trouble with that one seeing is that when you write for the National Review, you sometimes see a film, let's say in early December, and because it's a bi-weekly, and because I only write for two out of three issues, it can happen that it is now February and I have to write about this film that I saw in early December and I've forgotten the bloody thing. I can't remember a damn thing about it. 
and it's usually a very mediocre film which makes it so forgettable and then much to my much to my disgust I have to see the wretched thing again in order to be able to write about it this has happened a number of times has it ever happened that on second or third viewing of a film you change your mind slightly well slightly yes uh, in other words <laughs> Uh, you, it can happen that you, you think a film is very good and you see it a couple of more times and you realize that it's even better than that or that it's maybe not quite um, as good as that um, and of course it can also happen that you see something that you think is pretty bad and, and you think it's fairly hateful and you go back to see it again and you find out that it's totally hateful and infinitely worse than you thought. So there are bigger variations downward, I think, than there are variations mm. upward. And have you ever published a kind of revised review or retraction based on the d discrepancy between two viewings? It's amazing. You know, it's interesting that you should ask that because this, I find, is one of the most popular questions in, in any context. I mean, I think of all the questions that I've been asked, the two most frequent ones are, uh, why do you attack actors or actresses for the way they look? And the second most popular is, have you ever changed your mind about anything? Now, I don't know whether this means that I'm considered to be a, a, an arrogant, intolerant, stuck-up, elitist pig, and wouldn't it be nice if I had a little more flexibility and could sometimes change my mind about something? Or whether, on the contrary, it means the question that says, I'm changing my mind about things all the time, and gee, I hope that this great guy up there also changes his mind sometimes. Well, I have to disappoint uh, the, the, the mind changes, uh, or maybe not, uh, depending on, <laughs> again, on how they view this matter. I don't change my mind very often, and I, I have not published many mea culpa type of pieces, but I've done maybe half a dozen of them uh, in film and theater, altogether. I know I've thought much more highly of La Dolce Vita than I should have. Uh, I thought less highly of La Ventura than I should have. I thought less highly of Bergman's Winter Light than I should have. And there may be a, a handful of others. But by and large, I don't find that my uh, views change very much. And that may speak very badly uh, for me, but there it is. And also, when I do change my mind, I don't since I don't belong to the uh, intensely autobiographical school of criticism, I don't feel the need to write a little piece sort of explaining that I had a lover's quarrel when I first saw this film and therefore it broke my heart and I, it clouded my eyes and I couldn't see it through my tears. But the second time, I, I was happy and so on. I mean, I, so that I don't publish these formal retractions or revisions. What I do is I write another piece in some other context and I silently, by which I mean unacknowledgedly, revise my opinion. And I don't think it really matters why or how. It's just there. It's a new opinion and take it for what it is. Mm -hmm. And for example, if I remember correctly, you did kind of champion a lot of Lena Wertmuller's earlier work in this country. Yes. And I'm curious whether now over the years you feel that that is still justified. Do you still consider her, for example, to be a vital director for you? Yes, for the four films which are good, I, I, I have not. Mind you, I haven't seen any of them all that recently. But I would bet my bottom dollar that if I saw Love, and anarchy today, or if I saw Seven Beauties today, I would react pretty much, I mean, maybe 1%, 2% differently. Um, on the other hand, the rest of her films are, since then, I have not liked, and I doubt very much that I would like them if I were to see them again. Okay. I'm curious which other critics you read, either regularly or with great relish, well, with great relish, all of them, because, uh, because I mean, I need my daily dose of imbecility to keep, to keep, to keep sort of, to keep my happily jaundiced view of humanity. And where can I get this as readily and as, as fully as in reading some of my colleagues? But uh, um, sure, I, I, I try to read everyone, including Rex Reed. Um, um, in fact. In fact, but of course, luckily, I have, 
I have friends like Frank Rich who call me up and say, have you read Rex Reed on this? And I say, no, and then he reads it to me over the telephone. So. Um, and, uh, but anyway, uh, sure, I try to read quite a few of them. I try to read Stanley Kaufman when I can. I, try to, I, I pretty much read Pauline Kael uh, regularly. Um, I um, read the New York, whoever is reviewing the film in the New York Times. I, I almost always read. I read the Village Voice pretty faithfully. Uh, a few other magazines uh, that come, that fall into my hands irregularly, uh, I will read. But the others that I, I never see, for example, since we mentioned commentary, I never see that, so I don't know what Renier is doing. Uh, and, but in theory, I would, I would enjoy reading them all. It's just that life is short and that I do have various hats to wear and plus a little bit of living to do too on the side. Um, and it doesn't quite allow reading all those critics. And I actually read a few foreign critics occasionally too. Mainly French? Oh, French, German, uh, British, whatever. Again, it's sort of irregular, but I pick up, a, let's say, a new statesman or something and I read the film criticism. Do you ever read film theory? In other words, some of the Never, more? never, 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 never. I don't believe in theory in any field, be, at least in the arts. I think it's fine in science. I think it's wonderful in social science, which is a kind of miserable area altogether. And, uh, but, but in art, I have no use for, 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 for theory. I think it is a totally misguided notion that there is such a thing as a theory of art. And if there were one, it would be, it would be only there to be cast aside by, by next week or at the latest next month. So what's the point? I think in the critics that I've admired have always been gustatory critics, critics who tasted each work that they criticized and they ran it over their palates and they, you know, like wine tasting or food tasting and and then they reacted to it, and they didn't know that there was such a thing as semiotics, and indeed there isn't. Uh, and, they didn't know, and they didn't know that there was such a thing as post-structuralism, and indeed there isn't, because there also wasn't such a thing as structuralism, <laughs> so why should there be a post-structuralism? Uh, and so on down the line. I mean, these things are fine for, for desperate academics or, or uh, misguided laymen who who believe in desperate academics, but uh, <laughs> otherwise they have no reality whatsoever, for me. Now, do you believe that um, a work of criticism can or should be considered a work of art? Oh, absolutely. Uh, 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 I think writing is an art, we all know that. An essay is a work of art, we all know that. And if a piece of criticism at its best, mind you, at its worst, it, it can be toilet paper, but at its best, uh, it should be an essay, and it thus should be a work of art. And if it comes off, it is. It may not be the greatest work of art. I mean, you, you may not have little uh, replicas of it, like Michelangelo's David uh, in every homosexual's apartment, but, but, but it's nevertheless a, a work of art. Uh, so it's not a major work of art, perhaps. It's not, uh, it's not uh, the, the last, uh, you know, the last supper uh, that the French army crapped all over, but, but it, is a, it is a work of art. And if you could describe your ideal reader, the person or the people that you feel you're writing for, does that exist, or ultimately are you really writing for yourself and others who resemble you, or...? That sounded so funny that I was that I was sort of a little in a reverie over it. Would you mind repeating it again? Yeah. Whether well, is there some kind of ideal reader yeah. for whom you are writing? In other words, if you do, you envision a kind of reader or audience. Is it yourself or people? Well, who resemble I think you? the ideal reader is the strictest reader, and I have found that the strictest reader is I myself. Uh, I demand more. I expect more from myself than than. Uh, most other people. I mean, some people hate me so much that they don't expect anything from me. Some people love me so much that they don't expect anything from me that are such. Uh, the, some people are totally indifferent from, to me and they obviously don't expect 
much of anything either. So, so the only person who, who desperately cares, I feel, and who wants every sentence to sing, if it possibly can, which actually it can't, but some do, and on a good day, more of them do. On a less good day, fewer do. But I do expect that. I, I want cadences in, in, in the sentences. I want paragraphs to have a form. I want the whole piece to have a shape. Uh, I like a kind of rondo form in, 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 a, in a critical essay, if one can do it. Sometimes I experiment with different forms, like a dialogue form, or a short story form, or a whatever. Um, it's, it, I think one should definitely uh, expect oneself to write as best one can, and maybe even a little better if possible, or even if not possible. And, and that kind of harsh expectation one doesn't get from anyone else except from oneself. So I do write to uh, satisfy myself, and contrary to popular belief, I don't always succeed. Um, um, there are many times when I do feel that a piece is, is not up to par, but you have to get it in by a certain deadline, and that's all there is to it. But sometimes you really feel that you're in control of that pen. I always write in longhand first, and then I type it with two fingers. And sometimes you really feel that that pen is doing what you, what you want it to do. Maybe you are telling it, maybe it is telling you, that I'm not quite sure about, but it is doing right. And the sentences lock into one another, and the paragraphs have profiles, um, nice classic Greek profiles and, and, and the whole piece sort of flows and, and there's a beginning and there's a middle and an end and, and, it's, and it, it's really a joy to write it. Other times, eh, you grind it up. Are there uh, any one or two particular articles you've written that you cherish as being perhaps uh, your best work? In other words, let's say someone in the audience wants to know what they might read first to get the best sense of you? Oh, I don't know. Um, one has one's favorites, but I'm always very happy when people like a piece of mine that is not one of my favorites, because then I feel a piece that before didn't have a friend now has a new friend. Um, and so I wouldn't, I wouldn't um, force my opinions about what I consider my best work on anyone else. Um, I think people should discover for themselves what they like, and, and in any case, one shouldn't make things easy for people. One shouldn't tell them, read these three pieces, and then you can forget about the rest. Um, if, if people want to find out what you're about, uh, they have to make a certain effort. I won't go as far as James Joyce and say, it took me a lifetime to write Finnegan's Wake, therefore you, the reader, should also put a lifetime into reading it. Uh, but I will say that some effort is, um, is needed, and any attempt to, to lessen that effort on the part of the author would be counterproductive. I'm curious about how long does it take you to write a review? Well, uh, I'm a little more aware about how long the New York Magazine pieces take than I'm aware of how long, the, let's say, the National Review pieces take. And the average New York Review piece from, I don't have many ideas before I write usually. Um, I mean, I have some kind of vague unconscious ideas, obviously. And sometimes if I see a thing with a friend, we bat things around a bit. But I honestly don't know what I'm going to write until I actually start writing it. And in fact, uh, I can understand, if you'll forgive me, what Michelangelo meant um, by finding the, the statue in the marble. Uh, I find the piece in the paper, just as Mallarmé did with his poems, which is not to say that my prose is anywhere near as good as Mallarmé's poetry, but the principle is the same. Uh, so from the moment I sit down to the moment that I finish typing it, it's usually six hours. Uh, it might be less if I were writing in the daytime when I'm fresh, but alas, I always put things off till the last moment, and that usually means at night. And I very often sit up till four or five in the morning writing these pieces, and by that time I'm a little slower than I wish I were. So it usually takes about six hours, and this means everything, writing it in longhand, transferring it to typewriter with two 
fingers, and then making a few final connections. But I've never written the first and second draft of anything, except once maybe at the New York Times, when Bill Honan or some other whiz kid like that um, made me um, rewrite something uh, uh, years ago. And that, I think that's the only time there were two drafts of anything. You said something earlier about not making things too easy. And I assume that by that you also mean not to make it too easy for the reader to just take a review and say, okay, I have to see this film because he says this, I have to not see this film because he says that. I, I want to really lead this into a larger question about what you see as the distinction perhaps between reviewing and criticism. Uh, I mean, I think it was Walter Kerr who once made a distinction about how reviewing is just, you say, yes, see the film, don't see the film. Criticism is more of a dialogue where the writer presumes that the reader knows something about the material and can somehow answer mm -hmm. back to it. And I understand that for you it's much more the latter that you practice. But to what extent do you have to write a, quote, review in your sense or in the editor's sense? In other words, to what extent do you have to be a consumer guide? Not at all. Uh, I think precisely because of what we said a moment ago, whereby I hope you agree with me, our criticism is a work of art if it's well done, and a work of art is never a consumer guide. Uh, it is something that inspires certain feelings and certain ideas in the person who sees it, or in this case reads it, or if it were music, hears it, but it doesn't tell him what to think, it doesn't, or her, it doesn't tell him or her what not to think. It certainly doesn't tell anyone you must see this or you must not see this. Though a certain human weakness, which I don't consider really critical, it's human, uh, sometimes makes one go overboard and say, please go to see this, it's wonderful. Or I don't think I've ever said by no means go to see this, it's awful. Because I think if something is truly, truly awful, most people deserve to see it. And, and I would never want to prevent uh, them from having the wonderful privilege of uh, seeing uh, Heaven's Gate or, or something equally marvelous. Uh, or um, some, some splendor of Fassbinders in the grass. I would never want to deprive them of that. Um, but uh, if it's really quite wonderful, I sometimes, and I think one perhaps shouldn't do that, but I sometimes do say, please go and see this. I think what one does is one writes a, a, a very enthusiastic and eloquent review, um, praising and analyzing and uh, savoring and rejoicing. And that says, in other words, but it's important, in other words, go see this. But it's never such crude consumer guideism as see this or only see this if you have more than $50 in your pocket and if it happens to be raining very, very hard that day and you're caught in the street. Uh, that, that, that kind of uh, evaluation, which means three stars or four stars or two and a half stars, I think is beside the, beside the critical point. Mm. So consumer guideism, no, but perhaps the critic is arbiter of taste, yes? I mean, to create uh, certain standards by which works of art can be appreciated? Well, standards, you see, when you start talking about certain standards, then one is perilously close to theory. Then one is, one is sort of listening. on the verge of For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and you know, all of our that, programs, um, please visit us at 92ny.org. Depth of field is more important than montage, or montage is more important than depth of field, and so on, which I would never do. I mean, I'm, I'm willing to be charmed and seduced and repelled by, by either Bazin's values or um, whoever else's are. Uh, our uh, values, um, they might be, uh, Pudovkin's. Um, I don't insist that there is uh, some, that one type of thing is, is better than another type of thing. Although I would say that farce is a lower form than tragedy. But even then, if a farce is very well done, it is a work of art. And then it becomes somewhat of a quibble to say it's a lower work of art than something else, although it is. Uh, but, you know, um, I, we agreed that criticism is a lower, work, a lower form of art than poetry, but why dwell upon it? Uh, and um, 
so anyway, anything that smacks of theory, anything that smacks of of value judgments based on some kind of a system or based on, on some kind of a symbology or whether it's a semiotical symbology or any other kind uh, I find is, is repellent to me. Uh, the only way to deal with something let's say that's supremely beautiful is to find a poetic language, is to find a lyrical um, style and imagery and, and music in the language of the, of the critique that conveys something of the, of the splendor of the work under discussion. And it's by that kind of analogy, by that kind of uh, imagery, by that kind of modest attempt to convey the, the same uh, magnificence in a different medium that one sort of does the best kind of uh, criticism to my way of thinking that one can. And I think a good image, a good image and a good paragraph in which the sentence flows, in which the imagery works, does more for a film than uh, 200 pages of uh, Christian Metz. The irony, incidentally, is that, uh, as you probably know, I'm not from the semiotic camp or the theory You're not camp, what? from the semiotic camp. Yeah, I, yeah well, in I'm not, fact, a, not uh, uh, being ad hominem or ad feminam or anything. I'm just saying this. Now, actually, to extend that, because um, the anti-theory thing leads me to think about the masses and writing for them. And earlier you mentioned that perhaps some of the masses deserve to see some of the worst films. Yeah. You did once write that the sort of enemy, perhaps, was less the masses than the jaded intellectuals who apply their uh, minds to film. Do you feel that that's still the case? Well, it depends, you know. If, if, if the latest horror that I've seen is called Beverly Hills Cop, uh, then the enemy is both, because I find that both the masses and the fairly decent critics seem to think that's a wonderful film. I think it's a piece of garbage. Uh, when I see something like Walking Tall, which is also a piece of garbage, then clearly the enemy is the faceless mass, because they're the ones who promote Walking Tall. But when I see, let's say, um, a film by Werner Herzog that I think is revolting, then the enemy is the jaded intellectual, because who else would, would like that? Certainly not the masses. Uh, so it, the, the enemy changes according to the mm -hmm. film at hand. And indeed, see, sometimes the enemy is the critic. Um, I'm reminded of the fact that a few years ago, if I remember correctly, you resigned from the National Society of Film Critics mm -hmm. in protest when they admitted, was it Charles Champlin from the Los Angeles Times? And um, I'm wondering if you could maybe elaborate on the decision to dissociate yourself from a body of national critics. Was it... Yeah. Uh, well, it was Champlin because he came first alphabetically. Oh, I see. Uh, there were nine others who had their names begun with an A or a B would have done the trick just as well. Um, but, yeah, I thought... You see, the thing is, the National uh, Society of... Film Critics was founded in a, uh, in a burst of righteous indignation against uh, people like Bosley Crowther, mostly Crowther, but perhaps a few other newspaper reviewers who were thought to be even more imbecile than a critic has any business being. Uh, and God knows a lot of imbecility is eminently tolerated in that field, but this was Im imbecility above the call of duty and so uh, beyond. Um, so we felt that we had to have some uh, instrument, some critical instrument that would uh, counter pose itself or act as a counterpoise to the Crowthers of this world. And so the idea was that these would be slightly more fastidious, slightly more literate, slightly more thoughtful critics. But when you consider that one of the founding fathers was Hollis Alpert, I mean, that it sort of negates the, the premise right there. Um, and not to mention certain others. Um, nevertheless, there was some idea that these people could at least write a sentence, which was not entirely ascertainable about some of the others. 
And um, so, as long as the society pretended to be superior to some other group, be it ever so lowly, then some semblance of superiority, be it ever so vague, had to be maintained. And once they started dropping even that last semblance, uh, then I thought it was time to get out of there. And Stanley Kaufman's argument for staying for a while was that as I look around this table, I see a lot of people who are not a whit better than some of these people that you're voting against. I said, that is true, but suppose the proportion is five intelligent people and 13 idiots. That's a little bit better than five intelligent people and 39 idiots. I mean, we have a slightly better chance of, of maybe pushing through something worthwhile, and that's the difference. And it must have been a convincing argument because shortly after I resigned, Stanley resigned too. And yet you have remained in the New York film critic circle. Yes, because that is a group that has no illusions about its imbecility. Uh, it, 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 if, you, if you write for some kind of a publication that has more than 11 readers and is published in New York, you're eligible. And so as long as it's a totally honest piece of journalistic nonsense, why not? I mean, it's kind of fun to see how those people vote and how they deliberate. And then there's a party, and, and you, can, you can compare, at the party, you can compare Meryl Streep's hairdo with Jessica Lange's, and that's a valid aspect of criticism, surely. Surely. Um, now, another question. Sometimes when I've read your work, it reminded me at moments of some of the articles that I read of Francois Truffaut's in the 1950s when he was writing for Cahier du Cinéma, partly because of a certain passion and partly because there was a really vitriolic sense at times because the kind of uh, attacking that he was doing was based on having rather, I'm sorry to say, high standards. In other words, his idea of what films should be. And subsequently, Truffaut has said that the reason that his criticism had such a kind of acid edge to it was that he really was a frustrated filmmaker, a director at the time, who was attacking the work of others because he was not yet able to make films himself. All of which leads me to ask you whether you have ever yourself wanted to make films or tried to make films because is perhaps the, the desire for films to be great tied in with your ideal films that you might have uh, in your head? No, I think um, writing about something is very different from making it. Um, I think the only kind of critic who wants to give up criticism for filmmaking is someone who should give it up the sooner the better because it is someone who does not appreciate, does not take seriously, does not enjoy the dignity, the, the, the beauty, the artistry that there is in being a critic. And if they want to be filmmakers, by all means, let them do that. And if, if they're using criticism merely as a stepping stone to becoming filmmakers, then they're probably lousy critics. And the sooner they get the hell out into filmmaking, whether they make good, bad, or indifferent films doesn't matter, the better. Uh, and it's, I think it's a popular misconception that a critic is someone who has accumulated through years of movie going certain formulaic, a certain formulaic knowledge which he can then apply and why doesn't he make films since he has learned all these formulas while being a critic. That's not what it's about at all. Being a critic means being an appraiser who writes artistically about his appraisals. Being a filmmaker is someone who gets down and met to, to the nitty gritty and rolls up his sleeves and makes films and that's a wonderful thing and it's probably a more wonderful thing than writing criticism but not that much more wonderful. And there are actually a great many more decent filmmakers than there are decent film critics. So in a sense, I think, one is fulfilling a greater need by staying with criticism, assuming that one is any good, than by becoming yet another filmmaker, which I've never aspired to be because it's a technical thing. To make films means that you must deal with not only people who may or may not be machines, but with machines that certainly are machines, and machines and I don't have anything to say to each other, which is why I write in longhand and then sort of type with two fingers and wouldn't know from a computer terminal whether it's a hole in the wall or a baseball bat or what. 
Now, of course, between criticism and the actual technical filmmaking, there's a mediating territory that I should have included, and that's screenwriting, because even the great critic James Agee, in fact, went on to write the screenplays for The African Queen and Night of the Hunter. Has the idea of writing scripts ever tempted you? Well, that's a little closer to maybe to, to criticism, although it's still not all that close. No, it hasn't, partly because it's not my métier as I perceive it, but also because that, you see, is now a very hopeless thing. It probably always was a hopeless thing. A, screen, a screenwriter who is not also his own director might just as well flush his work down the toilet uh, for all the chance there is that it'll be recognizable to him when he sees it on the screen. And the only, I mean, if I were ever to get involved in, in making films, it would not be as a screenwriter because that's the person who gets trodden on and spat on and disregarded and not even invited to the right parties uh, at the, you know, he's, he's the forgotten uh, man or woman. So unless you are the director who also either completely writes the screenplay or at least part writes the screenplay, you're really not in control of anything and to me the important thing is to be in control which is why I write for magazines where I'm not censored which is where I could not write for the New York Times where I know that there'd be a certain Mr. Gelb and a certain Mr. Uh, Mr. Ro uh, Rosenthal and a certain Mr. Salzberger who had certain expectations from their critics and if they didn't meet them out they go so that's not criticism no. But surely sometimes when you see a film, the anger is of a kind that you feel, I mean, sometimes I know this happens to me and many other people, oh, I could have done this so much better, like had, had somebody along the way done so and so. The desire to revise, if not to create something original, does that ever hit you while you're watching a film? Or well, after? at the risk of making, making you fall off your chair, I will say something very modest now. Uh, I don't think I don't think I could do it better. I don't think I could do it better even than uh, Michael Cimino, much less, you know, much less Bertrand Tavernier. Um, so um, no, I've never had that urge because um, I, I have absolutely no faith, no confidence whatsoever that if I were confronted with with lights and cameramen and makeup men and uh, set designers and um, producers and, and actors who could only act in a certain ways and just because I pretended to be the director, what right had I to interfere with their way of acting, you know? Uh, so if I were confronted with all of those hurdles, I'd probably just forget about it. Of course, sometimes that works. I mean, the, we, we all know that there's a film called The Honeymoon Killers, which um, is a tremendous cult film in France and thought to be a great work of art. And the director, Leonard Castle, had a snit and left the set at a certain early point in the filming and never returned. And yet Leonard Castle on the strength of the honeymoon killers is a filmmaker in France without even being called Jerry something, you know, Jerry Lewis or Jerry Schatzberg or Jerry something. He's called Leonard something. It's most unusual. Uh, but he wasn't there when the film was shot. However, he is a director. Okay, I'm going to go to some of the audience questions now. Do you ever find yourself enjoying a, enjoying a film which you know is bad? Can you give some examples? Or does your liking a film make it good? Well, no. No. Uh, I think my genuinely liking a film for, for the right reasons, and there are the wrong reasons which we'll deal with in a second, uh, makes it good for me. It doesn't necessarily make it good for anybody else. Uh, but liking it for the wrong reasons is possible. For example, uh, I don't know, a piece of uh, pornography might sometimes hit the spot and be very <laughs> enjoyable. Uh, a um, a really stupid uh, farce that is, that is one degree above the idiotic or even one degree below the idiotic you might in certain moods um, be very pleasing especially if you're with the right person and can make funnier remarks about the film than the film is able to produce on screen uh, that's fine and that's a very legitimate um, satisfaction but 
what one does not do if one is a responsible critic is then pretend that this film amounts to a bag of beans. And yet about 85 to 90 percent of the critics I know, if they see something really colossally stupid but enjoy it, consider that a valid um, criterion for some kind of artistry in that film, and it's not. So yes, one can enjoy things for all kinds of wrong reasons. It's just that when one writes a review, one must not confuse wrong reasons with right reasons. And what kind of films are there? could be almost anything. Um, uh, I don't know, um, some, some really asinine bedroom farce might sometimes hit the spot. Another question, what about your theories on good looks in performers? Can you expound on those? The good looks in performers? Well, I think there is such a thing as legitimate subjectivity in criticism. No critic is even remotely objective. At best, one can try to be less subjective than the next fellow or have slightly better criteria, or slightly better uh, notions than the next fellow. That's about as much as one can do in terms of objectivity. There is no such thing. So, given that everything is subjective, um, certainly what one thinks is a beautiful face is also subjective. But if one takes the position that theater or film is a total work of art, that the faces in it, assuming that they're meant to be beautiful, assuming that they, they are of heroic proportions, that they're the leading man or the leading woman or the, or the ingenue or someone that people in the film fall in love with, uh, are meant to fall in love with, that the audience through empathy should also fall in love with, then I think uh, that actor or that actress should be aesthetically uh, pleasing as well as histrionically pleasing. And if he or she isn't, and here again, I can only use invoke my own subjective standards. Then uh, I uh, express my displeasure, just as if that person's uh, timing were wrong, or as if that person's way of moving were wrong, or as if that person's voice were terrible, or so on. Uh, that's equally subjective, but I think equally uh, legitimate and equally necessary. And no one has to agree with it. No one has to agree with anything a critic says. But I think it is good for the critic to have strong opinions, and it's good for him to have strong opinions on, on all aspects of the film. I, I, I'm always deploring critics, for example, and there are such, who never say anything about camera work. And yet there are a great many who don't. Um, there are a great many who never say anything about subtitles. Uh, and so on and so forth. And I think ideally one does all of those things. And I think the looks of the performers are very important. Now what my ideas of beauty are, I mean on that we would have to have a whole week-long seminar and that I think would not be worth it. Uh, just, um, you know, read my reviews and sort of get some notion of what that may be. I can't really sit here and give definitions, it wouldn't get us anywhere. Do you write to influence the makers of a film or play? or the viewers? I like to, to satisfy my own requirements, um, really. And if whoever derives profit or benefit from that should do so, and whoever doesn't, need not. But I'm not slanting it at filmmakers, I'm not slanting it at uh, um, assistant editors, I'm not slanting it at um, upper class or lower class moviegoers, I write for my own pleasure and my own satisfaction and for my own education because I try to learn something from, from what I write. I try to find out something about myself as well as about the film. And um, that's really what interests me. And whoever comes along for the trip is more than welcome and whoever wants to take some other boat ride is equally welcome. Would you favor us with an autobiographical summary of your early life in the countries you lived in besides the U.S. insofar as how they shaped your critical views? Well, I think that's the sort of thing that, that, it's, that if my criticism should ever rate a critical uh, study in its own right, I think it's the writer of that critical study who should speculate about these matters. I think it's uh, almost arrogant but certainly beside the point, what I think. 
on that subject. In other words, a critic should not analyze himself. That way lies narcissism, that way lies uh, self-importance. Um, you look at the thing you're looking at and you write about it. But why you write it this way and was it because in Yugoslavia there was no popcorn? Or was it because um, there wasn't the usual Saturday matinee with double features but some other format? And was it because uh, one saw more French and German and European films, although one saw plenty of American ones, never fear? Uh, and whether that made a difference, this may be so, but I think to speculate about that is, is to is to is sort of a kind of critical navel gazing, and I would much rather look outside than, than inside. Which filmmaker do you most admire? Well, a great many, uh, but I think it's unfair to uh, list five or six and then kick oneself because one forgot somebody else that one likes just as much. I think any question, by the way, that can be answered, that, that the questioner can answer for himself by reading a critic's writings, should not be answered in this format. I think the purpose of, of such sessions, if there is one, is uh, to say things that do not appear in one's writing. And, um, and I think the answer to that question is in my writing. And that would be a shortcut, and I'm against shortcuts. Mr. Simon, since drama is an artistic representation of reality rather than reality itself, why do you object to black Julius Caesars and female Hamlets? Would you read that again? Oh. Since drama is an artistic representation of reality rather than reality itself, why do you object to black Julius Caesars and female Hamlets? Yeah, well... Again, that's a good question, and, and to do an honest job on it, one would have to go into a very long song and dance, but briefly... Uh, we have time. Well, all right. Well, you may, but I'm not sure that I do. I mean, I'm thinking now in terms of months rather than <laughs> minutes. Uh, uh, I would say that artistic representation does not ignore reality. It uses reality as its starting point. It uses it just as in high jumping. I mean, you can't do a high jump without that earth or that trampoline or that, that floor from which you take off. If you try to do high jumping while floating, I mean, you're not going to jump at all. So I think the literal reality should be included in the final, in the final uh, work of art but it should also be transcended. But you cannot transcend without having your feet firmly planted in reality first and then going beyond it in various ways. Or if you happen to be doing a naturalistic work, then you don't have to go beyond it at all, at least not very much. Um, so, yes, I mean, ultimately art does go beyond literal reality, but I think literal reality is where you have to begin, and if there's something missing in the beginning, you're not going to get very far at the end, I think. Are there any films that are not widely distributed that you have seen and admired or enjoyed during 1984? And films that I've enjoyed in 1984? Yeah, that, that are not widely distributed? Is that, that are not widely distributed. I think that perhaps the question is related to what you said earlier, not that you've written about necessarily yeah. because they're not in distribution. Yeah. Well, you see, I think there is a kind of choice that one has to make as a critic. One can be the kind of critic who ferrets out things in remote corners of the earth and obscure little um, theaters and cinematheques and whatever. Uh, and that's wonderful, I, I don't knock that. But there's also another kind of critic who, by choice or circumstance, says, no, I'll leave that to other people. I will be the next stage in the critical process. I'll be the one who writes the review when the thing has already been discovered and when the thing is already available to um, most audiences. And, and for better or for worse, that's the kind of critic I am. I don't usually uh, take trips to um, 
Kurdistan to discover, you know, the latest Kurdish underground filmmakers' masterpiece. If it's that good, I assume, perhaps wrongly, that eventually it'll be at the uh, fine arts. No, there's no more fine no. arts at the <laughs> Paris, at the, at the plaza, at the whatever, and, and I'll catch it there. What has been the most challenging film for you to come to grips with? Well, maybe Persona, I would say. I, that I think I can answer. I think, to me, that is the a kind of ultimate in filmmaking. It doesn't mean that it's the best film ever made, but it's the one that, that one can speculate about and write about and worry about at greater length than anything else mm -hmm. I've ever discovered. I can second that by saying that I've shown it in some of my film courses and it has stimulated some really very interesting discussion. So. Yes, I dare say. Also some very useless discussion. Probably, yeah. but interesting uh, nevertheless. Uh, yeah. do, do you read other critics' works before or after your own review of the same movie? To what extent are you influenced by another review of the same work? Well, to me it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Uh, I know that there are some of my colleagues, one in particular who is mortally afraid of discussing, let's say, a film after a screening and who runs away as fast as he can so that no one should influence him or be influenced by him. No, I think he's not so worried about the latter as about the former. Uh, I don't feel that way. I'm, I'm more casual about that. I'll dis discuss films with other critics before I write about them. I'll read reviews by other critics before I write about them or after, or not at all, as the case may be. It, it doesn't really matter much to me, because I feel that, and that's arrogant, I admit, but I feel that I'm not susceptible to uh, that kind of um, uh, contagion, I don't think. Uh, I'm lucky that way. I don't catch other people's colds, and I don't seem to catch their opinions either. Uh, I just write what I think regardless of whether I've heard 15 disquisitions or read 12 reviews or, or, or not. However, if I do read a review before I write and if there's something particularly offensive in it, uh, sometimes I do um, attack that review in my, for example, in, my, in the next issue of the National Review, I, uh, I, I speak, I write about uh, stop making sense, and I say this is a piece of trash that is not worth reviewing. But Pauline Kael's view of it is something so horrendous and so disgusting and so, so inhuman and appalling that I feel I have to take that review on, so I review that review instead of the film. Uh, you are often accused of being misogynistic and homophobic. Do you take offense to these judgments? Oh, no, no, no. Uh, I, think, <laughs> I think anyone who, who takes, um, takes this kind of obloquy seriously might the next moment take praise from other people seriously too, and that would be truly disastrous. Uh, I'm a, a critic must not be swayed either by his fans or by his ill wishes. Uh, that, that's the one thing that, that being a critic is. It's being self-sufficient. That is what it is more than anything else in the whole world. And to believe attacks upon oneself is just as oshios and just as um, destructive as to believe praise of oneself. Um, Obviously, one is slightly more pleased by the praise than by the attack, unless the attack is from someone like Rex Reed, in which case one cherishes it, of course. <laughs> uh, but uh, but um, on the whole, one, one, one must guard against being impressed by that. Now, it is true. I mean, if, if, if I were to receive a letter in the mail tomorrow by Borges, saying, I've read one of your reviews and I think it's a work of genius. Of course, I don't read Braille, so it would be probably a problem. But anyway, uh, if I were to receive such a, such a letter in the mail tomorrow, uh, I would be very happy. I mean, I, that I can't deny. Or if I, you know, someone that I truly and, 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 and enormously admire, and if such a person were to say something good, I'd, I would be seduced into believing that maybe he's right 
or she. Uh, but otherwise, one just has to, um, you know, be fairly skeptical, both of plays and displays. No, I have nothing against against uh, women or homosexuals. I think they're good subjects for jokes, just as film critics are a good subject for jokes, just as uh, um, drama critics are a good subject for jokes, just as uh, Poles, if you'll forgive me, Annette, or Irishmen, or Jews, or, or blacks, or, or Yugoslavs are a good subject for jokes. I mean, everything is a good subject for jokes. And uh, the only thing that is not a good subject for jokes, obviously, is if you're living under a Nazi dictatorship uh, that is anti-Semitic, then Jews are not a good subject for jokes. But in a free society, or at least in a society that strives to be free, that pretends to be free, and I think that's probably as close as we ever get to freedom in this imperfect world, uh, there I think freedom means being able to make fun of everything and anything if the spirit moves you. And in that sense, I've probably made fun of, uh, of everything. It's just, that if you, um, it's just that if you make fun of, um, let's say, uh, fat actors, uh, fat actors aren't organized the way certain other minority groups are, are organized. And so you, there is not a, a, a society for the defense of fat actors from, from critical uh, uh, obloquy. Or, or, or whatever. So, so, then, so then that passes unnoticed and you can be a hell of a good guy even though every other week you make uh, some anti-fat actor remark. But let you make one um, remark about, uh, about um, I don't know, about uh, some woman not being um, attractive enough in a film and you are automatically uh, a uh, woman hater or something of that sort. These attacks are almost always made by remarkably unsightly women. Uh, I have yet, I've yet to be told by a beautiful woman that I've been unfair to, to women's physiognomies in my review. Are there any film actors and actresses that are worth watching? Any what? Film actors and actresses that, that are, are worth, worth watching. Well, all of them are worth watching for one reason or another. At the very least, to pan the hell out of them if they're bad, uh, and at the very best, to, uh, to praise them if they're good. Uh, unless watching is here an aesthetic thing, I don't I know. I suspect it might also mean to look out for, in other words, up oh. and coming is what I suspect, oh, although I'm, I I'm not sure. Well, what the... prediction, you know, that is one thing I never do. I mean, there are two things I don't believe in doing. One is lists. I hate lists. I don't believe in the 10 best films of the year. I don't believe in the 10 worst films of the year. Who knows? Um, 10 is, is a ridiculous number when you're dealing with worsts. It's, it's, it's way too little. <laughs> and, and it's a ludicrously over-generous number when you're dealing with best. So what's the point of such lists? Uh, that is one thing I don't believe in. Uh, and then if you're, if you're asked to, make, to do the 10 best films of all time, that's ridiculous too, because you know, who knows about all time? It's so hard to, to bear in mind something that you saw 30 years ago and, and to, to evaluate it against something you saw yesterday. These, these things always are bound to end up in dishonesty and falsification and obfuscation of one kind or another. So lists are out, and the other thing that is out is uh, it's something in answer to that question. Uh, what was it? What was the question? Are there any film actors, actresses that are worth watching? Oh, yeah. oh yes. The other thing is prediction. Yeah. The other thing that is totally off the wall is to try to say this is going to be the great event of the 1985 uh, season in the theater, or this is going to be the next trend in films, or that kind of uh, film is going to be um, more prevalent or less prevalent than something. Who knows? And who cares? The, the past is infinitely fascinating because we haven't digested it yet. The present is infinitely fascinating because it's, it's attacking us, it's, we're getting submerged in it, we risk, run the risk of drowning in it. That's fascinating. Or it may bear us aloft like a wonderful surf. Uh, that's fascinating, but what the future may or may not be, how do we even know that we're going to be around next year? Uh, I'm, you know, we may all shove off, we may all be blown to kingdom come, so what's the point? Let's worry about the past, 
which needs re-evaluation, and let's worry about the present, which needs evaluation, and let's forget about the future we don't know about. Okay. Do you think it's possible to be a good critic if you are on camera, i.e. those given three minutes on the local news or PBS's sneak previews? In a word, no. No. Which is why I'm surprised that you're having Roger Ebert in this series. Uh, of course, he writes a newspaper column too, but I doubt if you're having him as a newspaper critic. Uh, no, I think that is a, a, a tremendous uh, gulling of, 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 of the masses is to, to put some joker on television. And it's not even three minutes, it's usually much less than that. Although the kind of person who accepts to do criticism in a minute or a minute and a half is a, sw is a swine and, 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 uh, or a fool, which is maybe even worse. I don't know which is worse, frankly. But he's a fool or a swine and, and such people's opinions do not count. But what is sad is that there is a large population out there willing to believe a, a, a Gene Shalit or a Joel Siegel or a Roger Ebert or a Jeffrey Lyons or whoever they are, when, when by the very kind of work they do, they, they might as well go around with charlatan written in letters of fire <laughs> emblazoned on their foreheads. That they dare to show their faces in a, in a respectable gathering is a source of astonishment. <laughs> What else inspires you besides art and other critics' poor writing? What else turns you on in your free time? Oh. Well, I don't have very much, actually, because if you're really passionately interested in almost all the arts, with the possible exception of architecture, uh, which I'm also interested in, but, but less, um, then it doesn't leave you a lot of time. And as I say, there's always that terrible, uh, vulgar need to live a little as well. And that takes a lot of time. And by that I mean having friends, having eating companions, eating good food, um, making love um, to men or women or beasts. I don't really care. Uh, <laughs> and, um, you know, sleeping, which is sometimes nice. I don't do it very often, but... But when I can, I enjoy it. Um, I had four hours last night. I dearly wish it had been at least six. I would have been much smarter tonight. Uh, um, you know, there are things like that. There's walking, which is a wonderful thing. Uh, there would be taking trips abroad if I had more money and time. There would be such a thing as going into nature more often if I had a car. I once... <laughs> I once... I once was very close to a young lady who had a car and life was better then because there, <laughs> because there was much, aside from, aside from her value, there was the value of nature which I got a chance to enjoy and which I very seldom get to enjoy now because I'm no longer close to any cars. <laughs> Why did you change from being New York Magazine's film critic to theater critic? I didn't change. I was changed like a baby. Uh, 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 the, the, management, the management was upset that I attacked Annie Hall. The, by the management, I mean the Murdochs. Uh, because they go to the movies and they like Annie Hall. Whereas they don't go to the theater and they don't care. <laughs> Uh, and so they thought that I was a valuable writer, which, which talent they wanted to hold on to for the magazine, but I should not be allowed to crap on something that they considered important, like Annie Hall. I should go and crap on, um, you know, Tennessee Williams and um, Sam Shepard, which they consider unimportant. So um, that's how that came about. A related question, you have such strong ideals and such a high set of values that I wonder how you can justify working for a Rupert Murdoch publication. Oh, you see, the trouble, the, the answer to that is that, you know, in the same way that I justify riding the subway. Uh, there are a great many people that I ride the subway with that I certainly wouldn't want to get very close to. And... Um, Rupert is an absentee landlord. I hardly ever see him. I get less close to him than 
some of my fellow riders on the on the subway. Uh, and um, you know, you 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 have to share the same planet with a lot of people that you don't like. You have to share this city with a lot of people you like. You have to share the building you live in with a lot of people you like. Why shouldn't you share a magazine with a lot of people you don't like? Uh, as long as they don't interfere. And since nobody, Rupert included, uh, interferes with what I say in New York, except, as I say on the rare occasion when I overstep the boundaries of good taste as they perceive it, and since, happily for me, they don't have very much good taste, I don't get to overstep the boundaries very often. So, um, that's fine, you know, I don't care. I mean, I, I, don't think, I don't think publishers or editors are by the nature of the trade likely to be the most wonderful people in any publication. I mean, there's some professions, you know, like prostitution, publishing magazines, and a few others that do not appeal to, to sensitive souls and, and great, great, great moral characters. Okay. <clears throat> Somebody writes, I personally feel that many films are harmful, upsetting, and destructive to one's mental and physical health. For example, Psycho terrorized me and friends for years so that every time we got into the shower, we, and we still do today, 20 years later, fear that somebody is waiting on the other side with a knife. What films, if any, do you think are harmful to that or a similar degree where it induces either a totally destructive idea or a long-lasting, deeply ingrained fear? You know, it's sorry, I have this kind of undisciplined mind and, and, and the first half of that question fascinated me, <laughs> me and the second half lost me. It just occurs to me why, why the French like Psycho so much, because they don't go into showers very often anyway. <laughs> uh, uh, but what was, the, what, was the, what, was the, what was the second? The basic question was... What, was the, what, was the, yeah. what films, if any, do you think are harmful? to the oh. degree where it can induce either a destructive idea or a I fear. Think, I think 95% of the films we see are extremely harmful because they're stupid. And the most harmful thing in this whole bloody world is stupidity. But that is what there is so much of, that there is no law, there is no legislature, there is no critic, there is no authority that can, that can begin to make a dent in stupidity and certainly and certainly banish, not banish it, certainly not um, make it illegal, certainly not um, confine it to uh, Devil's Island, which wouldn't be big enough. I mean, maybe one could confine the non-stupid people to Devil's Island and leave the rest of the world to the stupid ones, I don't know. Uh, it's stupidity is the great sin and the great crime and the great horror. And if you look at history or if you look at anything, you find that ultimately stupidity is behind every evil that ever hit mankind. So that stupidity is the thing that we've got to fight. Uh, in ourselves, uh, in you in yourself, I in myself, every one of you in yourselves, as well as in other people. Um, and, but it's the hardest thing to fight because it's powerful, because it's everywhere, because it's hydra-headed, because it lurks in every corner, and because finally it, is, it, has not, it cannot be legislated away. Uh, but it is harmful. It is terribly harmful, and the best I can do against it is to is to write um, sharp, negative reviews of, of what I consider stupid uh, films, stupid plays, stupid books, stupid whatever. Um, there are other sins too, mind you, but they're all very small potatoes compared to stupidity, and its offshoots. Uh, uh, cruelty um, is, is an offshoot of stupidity, surely. Uh, nationalism is an offshoot of stupidity. Uh, all, all the things, you know, um, avarice is ultimately an offshoot of stupidity and so on. All the really ghastly things finally hinge on stupidity and uh, that is, is harmful. But how to do anything about it beyond denouncing it as devastatingly as a critic can, uh, I don't know that there is anything else we can do. And I admit that's like taking a slingshot to a behemoth. Uh, to pick up on the question of cruelty here, somebody asks, 
Why did you uh, hatefully ridicule Liza Minnelli's physical looks if she was not supposed to be playing a magnificent beauty and therefore the criticism of her nose, chin, etc., that nauseated you had no bearing on her talent or interpretation of her role? It seemed to me to be malicious. Do you or do you not regret writing that article? And if so, or if not, why? Why did you write it? May I add that I did enjoy your discussion tonight. Um, well, no, I would, if, if I had my, if I had my druthers, I would write that article every day of my life. Uh, I would try to make it better every day. I would try to make it more devastating every day. I would try to make it more efficient every day. I would try to make it harder for Eliza Minnelli to get a chance to recover from it every day. Um, um, no, I think that there is such a thing as, as, as a kind of awful self-love on stage, and it almost always em or screen, and it almost always emanates, not always, but almost always, from truly repellent people, because they use it as a form of overcompensation for their repulsiveness, and 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 it's this kind of uh, stage or screen masturbation, uh, uh, as well as. And it's not even respectable masturbation done by oneself in the privacy of one's whatever, bathroom if one is Portnoy, bedroom if one is somebody else. Uh, but it's mass masturbation. It's asking the audience, please come up to the stage and, and masturbate me. And that is what the Streisands and the Minnellis and, the, and many others of that ilk, lesser ones, do. And that, to me, is, is artistically the sin against the Holy Ghost, and it has to be attacked. Um, anyone who plays a leading role in the act, or in some such play as the act, this, this particular review of Liza Minnelli was in something called the act. Uh, this may mean an act in a play, or it may mean a criminal act. I don't know what kind of an act, but it was called the act. And in this particular act, she was the star, she was the sinusure, she was the person that the other characters revolved around. She was the character with whom the men on the stage were falling in love. And I looked at this creature and said, this creature is so repulsive that if she were the last woman on earth, I would rather cut my thing off than get involved with it. Given that situation, I think I had to express my, my loathing. Uh, and it's not only physical repulsiveness, it's, it's much more a spiritual repulsiveness, which nevertheless, in some subtle ways, is connected with the physical repulsiveness. Um, you know, the Greeks were no fools. When they, worshipped, when they worshipped the beautiful human face and the beautiful human body, uh, that was part of one of the great cultures, one of the greatest cultures in the history of mankind. And, and unless you're prepared to say that the Greeks were full of uh, whatever, uh, you cannot reject the notion that the beautiful face and the beautiful body are a paramount, and I don't mean it in the sense of Metro Goldwyn Mayer, I mean it, yeah, a paramount fact of, 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 of um, human culture and human aesthetics and human uh, perfectibility, if there is such a thing. And to, to be blind to that, to, to pretend that, that, that this Liza Minnelli that's up there on stage is in fact something charming and graceful and beautiful and elegant and desirable, is either to delude oneself at a rate which, which is, is, I think, um, frightening. It's, it's almost as if you went around you know, as if you went around uh, though you were Joe Blow pretending that you were William Shakespeare. I mean, it's a delusion of that magnitude, I think. Uh, or else it is, it is such a lack of taste. It is, again, to my way of thinking, and all criticism, of course, is to my way of thinking. Uh, it is such a, 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 a failure to, to distinguish between what is what is beautiful and what is, what is horrible, that, that again, um, it has to be attacked. And it cannot be attacked in terms of all the fools who, who find this thing beautiful. It can only be attacked in terms, because that's, there's no way of getting at them. The only way you can get at this delusion is to attack the source of the delusion, 
Though I admit that the greater damage is done in each individual soul that thinks that Liza Minnelli is something that can be tolerated, uh, or something that can be admired, or something that can be put into the leading role of a play or film, that's, those are the really damaged areas, but those you can't deal with. You can only deal with the source of this sickness, so you attack the source rather than each individual carrier of the sickness. And you have to attack it uh, as uh, well as you can. And the best device there is, is humor, is wit. Um, obviously, uh, you can't use sticks and stones, nor would you wish to. Uh, you can't use um, homiletics, because homiletics is out. Uh, you can't uh, write a religious tract against uh, Liza Minnelli, so what is left is satire, uh, caricature, wit, humor, and so you use that, and you try to use it as Daumier used it, uh, Mutatis Mutandis, as Goya used it, as, as whoever the great uh, visual satirists were, or, or, uh, or the way Jonathan Swift used it, or the way Karl Kraus used it, or whoever. Always remembering that you're only a critic and that Goya and um, Daumier were, were great artists, and you're only a little artist, but still, you do the best you can. To uh, move to another actress, you wrote a glowing article on Nastasia Kinski in Rolling Stone. Judging from her subsequent career, do you think she's lost those qualities that you so admired? Uh, I think I was totally wrong. <laughs> uh, I, don't, I don't think she ever had them, in fact. But, but I was deluded by not her looks, because her looks don't excite me very much, uh, but I was deluded by a certain, what I thought was rather touching uh, striving to be a real actress, a rather touching attempt to cultivate her mind, her, her uh, taste, her artistic um, knowledgeability, and there was, or there seemed to me, to be a genuine striving, a genuine concern to learn about acting, to read books, to see plays, to go to concerts, to, to cultivate her mind. And that combined with the fact that she had certain gifts. For example, I admire her gift of languages. I admire the fact that she could pick up English in the little time that she did and could play Tess somewhat convincingly, even in a in a, in a sort of English dialect, if you will. And there, is a, there was a certain flexibility about her at that time uh, that, I, that I, I liked, and a certain willingness to stick her chin out. Um, she also stuck out other parts, but uh, nevertheless, the chin. And this, this probably blinded me, and I don't think that she has been very impressive as an actress since, although I think her beginnings were promising. And this is, again, a a, an object lesson that one should not be prophetic or pretend to be prophetic. One should not try to read the future on the basis of whatever it is, the bowels of, uh, of chickens or, or tentative little performances that augur well but that might be blind alleys leading nowhere. I think I was definitely wrong in this case. We have time for about one more question. How do, you see the, how do you see the state of the American cinema these days? Is there any hope? Oh, there's always hope. Otherwise, we'd have to go home and turn on the gas oven. Uh, uh, or the TV set. Or, or the TV set, yeah. Well, <laughs> I wouldn't go that far. Uh, uh, yeah, there is hope. Um, there, there's always one or two good films a year. And after a while, after, after a certain amount of living, you become grateful for those one or two films. If 1984 has done, does nothing else except Tavernier's uh, A Sunday in the Country, if it does nothing else besides, on a much humbler level, but, but still a very human and charming level, uh, The Gods Must Be Crazy, if it does nothing else but to the extent that it is good, and that means only the background, it's a film that you have to sort of, as the Germans say, ausschalten, you have to switch off 
the foreground and just see the background, and I mean the killing fields. It's the film with the greatest background in years. And so you just ignore the dialogue and the music and the plot and, and the friendship between these two men. And you just look at those backgrounds of what war, especially civil war, can be like. And that, I think, is sublime. So as long as there are three or four things like that, um, and there's probably one or two other films that I can't think of now because I can never think of them when you say this is the last question and we have 30 more seconds. Uh, but one or two others that I'm probably forgetting. As long as there are those things, there's no reason to despair. It's just that one should not expect to be able to walk into any one of 10 or 12 movie houses on your block and see 10 or 12 wonderful films, in one in each one of them. That, that would be absurd and, and unrealistic, and, and uh, anyone who expects that deserves to see whatever he or she will see. But as long as there are these four or five other things, I think there's plenty of hope, and one must be modest about these things. Well, on that note, I'd like to thank John Simon for being with us tonight. Thank you.